We're in the third week of the sermon series, Issues. Somebody say Issues. We're going to continue Hannah's story in the book of 1 Samuel. But I want to give you a quick recap. Hannah had barren issues. And for whatever reason, God closed her womb. But thankfully for her, it was just a season, a barren season. How many feel like you're in a barren season today? Let me see your hands. A couple. How many feel like it's been forever? But the good thing about seasons are they come and they go. Just like in Iowa, one day it's spring and the next day it's winter, y'all. And here's the thing. We can't control the weather or the seasons. I said we can't control the weather or the seasons. Seasons are out of our control. There are some things in life that we simply can't control, church. And I know that's hard for some of you control freaks. Because you want to control everything, right? How many would be honest in church today and say, I want to control everything? How many would say, I want to control everybody? <laughs> Come on, you're in church. <laughs> but see, there's a thin line between control and manipulation. I'm not going to preach that today, but maybe sometime soon. There's a thin line between control and manipulation. And how many know somebody? Mm, not you, of course. But you know somebody that manipulates, right? We can't control everything. We can't control everyone. Again, let me ask you. You don't have to raise your hand. How many want to control everything and everybody? I'm going to set you free today. Because you can't. So stop trying. You can't control everyone. You can't control everything. So stop trying to control everything. Stop wasting your time. Stop worrying about what you can't control. Stop complaining about what you can't control and start praising God because he's in control, y'all. And, and praise him because seasons come and seasons go. Hannah's barrenness was temporary. It wasn't permanent. And I want to say that to those of you who are in a barren season today. It's temporary. It's not permanent. Although it feels like it. We all go through barren seasons. Barren seasons come and barren seasons go, right? They come out of nowhere and they can seem like forever. But praise God, they're not. But nevertheless, they put our faith to the test don't they in these seasons it feels like God is absent like he's nowhere to be found like he doesn't hear us or see us anymore and it's, we're not even sure if he cares anymore it's easy for barrenness to turn into bitterness it's easy for barren seasons to turn into bitter seasons and when this happens we stop we give up we walk away and in essence bitterness blocks the future that God has for us and so the word of the Lord for you today is don't let barrenness turn into bitterness don't let a barren season turn into a bitter season believer okay let's go to 1st Samuel chapter 1 verse 10 the Bible says Hannah was in deep anguish crying bitterly somebody say bitterly as she prayed to the Lord and she made this vow O Lord of heaven's armies, if you look upon my sorrow and answer my prayer and give me a son, then I will give him back to you. He will be yours for his entire lifetime. How many wish it was that easy? Just pray that over your child and boom, their entire lifetime. Mm, that's another sermon. And as a sign that he has been dedicated to the Lord, his hair will never be cut. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you would anoint this sermon right here, right now. In your mighty name, amen. amen. Hannah was bargaining with God. How many has ever bargained with God? Come on, you're in church. You can't lie in church, right? God, if you do this, I promise to do that. 
The policeman's prayer is, Dear Lord, if you get me out of this one, I promise I'll never do it again. How many have prayed that prayer? Come on, I have a feeling some of you prayed it last night. Right? God, if you help me in this situation, I promise I'll go to church for the rest of my life. I won't miss a Sunday. And God gets them out of the predicament, but their vow only lasts one Sunday, y'all. If you'll show me you're real, I'll believe in you forever. God, if you help me get a pay increase or hit the lottery, I'll pay my tithes. Hmm? But let me say this. If you don't pay your tithes before you hit the lottery or get a pay increase, you won't after. I'm just saying. God, if you keep me from getting caught, I'll never do it again. Sound familiar? Or how about this one? Jesus, if you help me pass this driving test, Carson. Jesus, take the wheel. <laughs> I'll only listen to K-Love. <laughs> and I won't drive like those idiots in Omaha. Or, or Carter Lake. Or Persia. All right? <laughs> but how many times have we failed to keep up our end of the bargain with God? Hmm? how many times Hannah prayed God if you give me a child I'll give this child back to you and whatever God gives us church we've got to learn to give it back to him because it's his anyways whatever he gives us whatever he blesses us with it comes from him every gift comes from above and so we've got to learn to give it back to him because it belongs to him anyway he's just letting us use it it's the same with our kids they're, they're gifts Praise God, those little demons are gifts from God. <laughs> but we got to give them back to Him. We got to entrust, he's, He entrusted them to us, but we got to trust Him with them, y'all. We got to pray for them daily, but trust that, that He's going to lead them and guide them. And then when they get to that age of accountability and, and, and stepping out and, and growing wings, at some point we got to let them. Fly. I'm not talking about kick them out. <laughs> Let them fly. Let them become who God called and created them to become because God has a plan for their life and it's not always your plan, Mom. It's not always your plan, Dad. I wish it was. You know, but God's plans are bigger and better and greater than mine. And so I have to trust my Father that He has plans for my child. Amen. Give them to him. Hannah didn't pray, God, if you don't give me a child, I'm not going to serve you. I'm not going to pray to you anymore. I'm not going to go to church anymore. And while I believe it's okay to bargain with God, we can't give him ultimatums, church. And the vows that we do make, we need to try not to break. Amen? In verse 10, the Bible says, though she was resentful. Think about that. Let that hit home. Though she was resentful, she prayed. You know what resentful means? It means bitter. It means angry. It means upset. It means offended. But notice that Hannah prayed even though she was resentful. Even though she was bitter, even though she was angry, even though she was upset, even though she was offended, she prayed even though. She prayed even though. The Aramaic Bible says her soul was bitter. But who was Hannah bitter with? Was she bitter with Penaniah, the other woman? Probably so. Was she bitter with her barrenness? Maybe so. She could have even been bitter with God, but yet she prayed even though. Come on, she could have been bitter with God, but she prayed anyway. Even though. The title of my sermon today is Even Though. Somebody say, Even Though. Yeah. Hannah prayed even though God hadn't answered her prayer and gave her a child. Hannah prayed even though she was still barren. She prayed even though she was resentful and bitter. I'm telling you, believer, to pray even though. 
Pray even though God hasn't answered your prayer. Pray even though you might still be barren. Pray even though you're resentful, bitter, angry, upset, or offended. Pray even though. And I've got some good news and some, unfortunately, bad news on prayer today. Which one you want first? Well, I've got the mic, so I'm going to give you the good news first. <laughs> See, the good news is God answers prayers, y'all. I said go the good news is God answers prayers. No prayer goes unanswered. How many know that? Every prayer that you pray, God answers in one way or another. But the bad news is he doesn't always answer when we want him to and how we want him to. Amen? And although that might sound like bad news, it's actually good news because God knows best. I said God knows best. And through prayer, he directs us to his best, to his will. See, many times we're down here, and I mean down here in the dumps, y'all, in, in, in the pit, in a low place, trying to tell God what to do up there. Like we know more than he knows. Come on, think about it. He sits on the throne, y'all. He's sovereign. He holds the whole world in his hands. He knows what he's doing. He's omnipotent. That means he's all-knowing. How many are omnipotent this morning? He is. How many are sitting on the throne this morning? He is. Come on, think about it. Who is sitting on the throne of your life? You or him? Only you can answer that. Who's in control? You or him? Point number one. Prayer is about receiving direction, not giving direction. Come on, think about it. How many times do we try to direct God? God, I need you to do this on this day. I, I need you to do this, God. See, the modern-day church has it all backwards, church. Christians today have it all mixed up. And it's time for the church to stop giving God directions and start receiving His. We've got to get simply better at receiving His directions church when we pray we need to pray God let your will be done not my will think about it when Jesus taught us how to pray through the Lord's prayer you remember that prayer it starts off with our father which art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done think about it Jesus said when you pray pray God let your will be done not my will and Jesus modeled that think about it in the garden of Gethsemane he said, if there's any other way, let this cup pass. But nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. It's time for the church and the body of Christ to start praying, let your will be done instead of my will. In the NIV, it says in deep anguish. The contemporary English version says that she was heartbroken. I just want you to see and to feel exactly where Hannah was in this moment. I want you to truly understand her emotional state in this moment. She was really, 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 did I say really, really discouraged, y'all. Because the Bible says that she wasn't eating. And you got to be really, 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 really discouraged not to eat. Right? Although it's reversed for me. I eat when I'm discouraged. Any emotional eaters in the house? <laughs> Imagine how hangry Hannah was. <sighs> hangry Hannah. That fits. Some of you look hangry this morning. What's wrong, Bob? <laughs> Did you not get breakfast? Somebody get this guy a donut. <laughs> Just think about it. Church, she was bitter, but she didn't stay bitter. And I can't and I won't preach, don't get bitter, because it's impossible. I said it's impossible. Somebody say mission impossible. We've all been bitter. How many know pastors aren't exempt from being bitter? Hmm? No, pastors shouldn't feel anything, right? When a pastor get, gets hurt, they shouldn't feel hurt. Think about it. 
Pastors shouldn't get angry when their members do crazy, stupid stuff. Pastors shouldn't get upset. Pastors shouldn't be bitter when members leave church for no reason because they're bitter. It shouldn't affect the pastor, though, should it? The pastors are real, just like you. I can't tell you how many... Not, let me go back. There's a few people that have left Crossroads, and they came to me and said, Pastor, God told me to leave. I said, okay, well, where did he tell you to go? I don't know. So the God that told you to leave didn't tell you where to go. Hmm. Maybe pray about it a little more. <laughs> Pastors aren't exempt, just like you. She didn't stay bitter, though. And the message isn't don't get bitter. The message is don't stay bitter. Bitterness is an emotion. Think about it. And you either control your emotions or your emotions control you. And too often our emotions are in control, right? Too often the, our emotions get the best of us. Bitterness is an emotion that is very, 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 very controlling. Believe me, I know. I've been con controlled by emotion or by bitterness for too long. How many would say that you've been controlled by bitterness at some point in your life. We will all be faced with many, many opportunities to choose bitterness, to stay bitter, and to be controlled by bitterness. In verse 6 in the Amplified, it says, Hannah's rival provoked her bitterly to irritate and embarrass her because the Lord had left her Childless. Now think about it. Hannah had every right to be bitter. Her rival, Penaniah, the other woman, provoked her bitterly. And so she had every right to be bitter, and to be bitter with Penaniah. And it's hard at times to understand how a God can bless someone like Penaniah. And that someone like Penaniah can be blessed, but someone like Hannah could be barren. But in Old Testament times, they would call her what? cursed now isn't that hard to understand at times how god blesses so and so especially after knowing penaniah's heart how ugly it was and how pure hannah's was it's hard to understand that but hannah chose forgiveness over bitterness think about it she chose to forgive and not be bitter with Penaniah. And although she was barren, she didn't allow her barrenness to lead to bitterness. I'm preaching to some people today who have a bitterness issue. God gave me this sermon today for some people who have a bitterness issue. Verse 12 says that Hannah kept praying. Or we could say that she prayed even though. See, bitterness will affect your prayer life. Because it's hard to pray to a God that you're bitter with. Think about it. But pray even though. Habakkuk 3, 17, 17 says, even though. Somebody say, even though. Even though. even though the fig trees have no blossoms and there are no grapes on the vines, even though the olive crops fail and the fields lie empty and what? Barren. Somebody shout barren. barren. Even though the flocks die in the fields and the cattle barns are empty, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. Philippians 4.4 4 says to rejoice in the Lord always or anyways, even though. And Psalms 34.1 says, I will bless the Lord at all times. Somebody shout all times. <laughs> Believer, don't let your emotions dictate your praise. Because if your praise is dictated by your emotions, you won't praise like you should, as much as you should, or as loud as you should. And listen, I'm not saying praise has to be loud because it's not about the height, it's about the depth. And our praise must come from somewhere deeper than our emotions. 
because our emotions are all over the place. Come on, they're up, they're down, they're here, they're there, they're like a roller coaster, just up and they're down, and our emotions can be manipulated. People will manipulate your emotions. Circumstances will manipulate your emotions. Barrenness will manipulate your emotions. And so we have to choose praise regardless of where our emotions are. Just like emotions are a choice, so is praise. And so choose praise no matter how you feel. Come on, choose praise no matter how things appear because God is faithful, y'all. He's still on the throne. He's still Jehovah Jireh, your provider. He will meet all of your needs according to his riches and glory. Listen, you can praise him because you can trust him. Can somebody praise him this morning? It's time for the church to start praising him even though. Even though we're in the middle of a battle, even though our circumstances look gloom, even though something's coming against us, even though we have no money in the bank, even though we just lost our job, even though our marriage is falling apart, it's time for the church and the body of Christ to start praising him even though. And listen, I'm not saying praise him because of your brokenness, your barrenness, or your emptiness. I'm not saying praise him because of your circumstances. No, I'm saying praise him even though. No matter what your circumstances look like, it's choosing praise over complaining. In fact, complaining is anti-praise, y'all. It's choosing joy over sorrow. It's choosing encouragement over discouragement. It's choosing forgiveness over bitterness. It's choosing to be positive in this situation instead of being negative. And you know that we choose our countenance? Hmm? Like, we choose what our face looks like. Some of you need to get that. Because right now, I really don't know what you're choosing to be or to look like. I can't tell if you're hangry or happy. I can't tell if you're blessed or if you're broken or bitter. Everyone put a smile on your face. Come on, help me out, Jan. You can smile better than that. I'm looking at everyone. <laughs> nice. Good one. You just chose to smile. That was a choice. Now make a sad face. That's a good one, Lisa. We choose. We choose. Come on, we choose. Make an upset face. You, you can quit playing the game if you want, but... I just wanted you to see how easy it is to change our facial expressions. We choose. We choose our countenance, whether it's radiance or gloominess or moodiness. And honestly, sometimes I'm not really sure what most of you are choosing. Think about it. Daily, when you walk into the job that you were blessed with, that meets all of your needs, come on that you're paid for weekly. Do you walk in gloomy, moody, or do you walk in blessed, highly favored? Are you an example to everyone in the, in the workplace? Come on, think about it. It's so easy to lose our minds and our perspective in the midst of whatever it is that we're going through. If God blessed you with the job, go to the job blessed. Walk in blessed, highly favored. You're too blessed to be stressed, right? Come on. We're too anointed to be disappointed. It's all about perspective. And it's time for the body of Christ to start walking in joy. It's time to, to take our joy back. The enemy's held it too long. You say yes, but you're not smiling, Kelly. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Thank you. Hebrews 12, 15 says, Let no root of bitterness spring up among you. By it, many are defiled. Bitterness is like a seed. Can you see this seed? Can you? Can you on the back? How about in the balcony? Online, can you see this seed? I sure can. That's the way bitterness works, y'all. I can sure see it. See, the devil is great at turning something this small, 
into something this ginormous. Nothing into something. Bitterness, the Bible says, will defile you. It will also derail you. Think about it. Bitterness will derail your spiritual life because it's hard to serve a God that you're bitter with. But Hannah chose forgiveness over bitterness. Many have turned away from God because of bitterness. Bitter with God and bitter with his people. Right? Think about it. How many have ever been hurt at school but yet you went back to school right many times we get hurt by people real people humans and we lose faith we walk away we give up on God many 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 have turned away I, I, I can't tell you how many I, people I've saw that have turned away because they were bitter with God because God didn't answer their prayer when they wanted him to and how they wanted him to. I've seen people bitter with people in the church. I've seen people bitter with me walk away. But Hannah turned to God instead of away from God. Think about it. She turned to him instead of away from him. What you do with your bitterness will determine how long you stay bitter. I said, what you do with your bitterness will determine how long you stay, stay bitter. What you do with this seed of bitterness will determine if it grows or not if you give it to the devil I promise you as your pastor it will grow into a full grown redwood tree from California y'all Hannah took her bitterness to God and so therefore she didn't stay bitter give your seed of bitterness to God and he will replace it with a seed of forgiveness Hannah didn't take her bitterness out on Penaniah. How many would have? Let's be honest. I, I'm getting bitter just saying her name this morning. Think about it. But this story isn't about Penaniah. You know that, right? Who's it about? Hannah. Although I'll tell you that Penaniah's story didn't turn out so well. Penaniah was punished, but Hannah was blessed. We haven't got that far in the story yet, but some of you know the outcome because you've read this story before, right? Point number two, favor follows faithfulness. I said favor follows faithfulness. I'm telling you, believers, favor will follow your faithfulness. And favor followed Hannah's faithfulness. She stayed, she remained faithful to God even though, somebody say even though, she stayed. She remained faithful. And there's a message in her faithfulness. The Bible says in Psalms 101.6, I will look with favor on the, those who are faithful. And then according to Proverbs chapter 3, faithfulness is how we find favor. Favor with God and favor with men. How many want favor this morning? Come on, let's be honest. How many want and desire favor? How many pray for favor? I, I pray for favor almost daily. God, give me favor with you and give me favor with men. I, I want favor. And, and, and many pray for favor. They want favor, but they lack favor because they lack faithfulness. Come on, I'm preaching. It's like this. Many want a powerful testimony, but they lack it because they're unwilling to go through the testing to receive it. See, Hannah's testimony came through her testing. God's favor followed her faithfulness. God used her story for his glory. He turned her issue into an opportunity. He turned her barrenness into a blessing. James 1.12 says that God blesses those who patiently endure testing. So point number three, blessing comes through testing. Come on, blessing comes through testing. Some prayers are answered immediately, and I love immediate answers. Amen? Anyone with me? You love immediate? Raise your hand. I love when God answers my prayers immediately. In fact, I want God to answer my prayers overnight. 
In fact, God, I will pay for the overnight shipping if you'll answer my prayer overnight. But it doesn't work that way, does it? See, many prayers take weeks, months, even years to be answered. Church, I've prayed for almost 10 years for acreage. I'm still praying and believing, even though. One commentator said that Hannah could have been barren for 19 years. Think about it, 19 years. That's a long time to pray, even though. That's a long time to hold on to faith, even though. That's a long, long time to not be bitter. And if Hannah would have stopped praying or if Hannah would have stayed bitter, we wouldn't be reading her story today. Come on, I wouldn't be preaching about Hannah today. In fact, I believe if Hannah would have stayed bitter, she would have stayed barren. But Hannah didn't allow her bitterness to block her future. Believer, do not allow bitterness to block your future. If you stay bitter, you'll stay barren. And remember, this isn't just about barren wounds. This is about every form of barrenness. And I don't know where you're barren this morning, but wherever you're bitter, you'll stay barren. Point number four, where you choose to stay bitter, you choose to stay barren. Come on, I say, where you choose to stay bitter, you choose to stay barren. If you choose to stay bitter, you will stay barren. And if this principle is true, that means that Bitterness determines barrenness. And so if bitterness determines barrenness, does forgiveness determine fruitfulness? Hmm. Come on. Just as faithfulness determines fruitfulness. Galatians 6, 9 says, Let us not get tired of doing what is right or what is good. At just the right time, somebody say at the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Church, fruitfulness is tied to faithfulness. Verse 16, Hannah said, I've been praying all this time. This is the contemporary English version. I've been praying all this time. In other words, I've been faithfully praying all this time, telling the Lord about my problems. The CSB translation says, I've been pouring out my heart to the Lord. I'm preaching to those this morning who have been pouring out their heart to the Lord. I'm preaching to those this morning who have a bitterness issue. Is there a prayer that you've prayed for years? Is there a prayer that you feel like God hasn't answered? Who am I preaching to this morning? If that's you, I want to see your hands. Verse 17. says, Eli answered, Go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. Eli was the priest. And so a priest can't lie, right? Right? Like, priests can't be pedophilers, Right? Just saying, if you rearrange the letters of Eli, it might just spell lie. <laughs> I was doing a wedding a couple weeks ago, and before the wedding, I was talking to the best man and to his wife, and his wife said something. I can't remember exactly what she said, but he said, you heard that, right, Pastor? It's like, yeah, I heard it. And he said, well, you'll be my witness, right? Because pastors can't lie. <laughs> but then he said something that shocked me. He said, although my pastor lies to me all the time. I was like, hold up. Don't tell me his name or the church you go to. Just in case I know him, I, I don't need to hear this. <laughs> but then I said, but let me say this. You might be going to the wrong church, bro. <laughs> If your pastor lies to you, you might want to choose another church. Eli the priest said, may God grant you what you're asking for. The voice translation says, don't worry about this anymore, Hannah. 
And church, she stopped worrying. Come on, I said she stopped worrying. She believed. You know how I know that? Because the Bible says she started eating again. <laughs> and her face, her countenance changed. She was no longer sad. Everything changed. She started believing again. I don't know what you're praying for this morning. I don't know what it is that you're asking God, but like the priest, I do want to say to you this morning, may God grant you what you're asking him for, if it's according to his will. And, and I don't know when or how he'll answer your prayer, but I can tell you he will, one way or another. You might not like the way he answers. You might not like when he answers, but I promise you God will answer your prayer, one way or another. But we've got to get to the place where we we trust him regardless of how he answers. God, I trust you. I trust your plan over mine. I'm going to close with Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. I want to read it from the Passion Translation this morning. The Bible says, Don't allow yourselves to be weary in planting good seeds. For the season of reaping the wonderful harvest you've planted is coming. Church is coming. Come on, the Bible says it's coming. And, and if God's word says it's coming, it's coming. Come on, believer, it's coming. The, the answer to your prayer is coming. I don't know when, I don't know how, but it's coming in one, some way or another. God will answer according to his will, his purpose, his plan is coming. God sent me here today with a prophetic word for some of you. In fact, all of you in some way. This is a seed word. Can you see it now? <laughs> Can't take my seed, devil. Peter said that God's word is like a seed. And you don't have to be a farmer to know that seeds take time to grow, right? Depending on what type of seed it is determines how long it takes to grow. Think about it. They all have different growth seasons. By the way, this is a green bean seed. I don't really know how long it takes to grow. Do you, Dave? 14 days. Think about it. Seeds take time to grow. But what do you do with seeds determines if it grows or not. Seeds have to be planted. And so whatever seed that God spoke to you today, whatever word he spoke, you have to plant it. Like you can't leave it at the door. You, you can't, you got to plant it. And then you have to water it. It needs some sunlight, y'all, for it to grow. I'm, I'm preaching spiritual. See, God gave me this word today to give you you, this seed. I'm just a farmer planting seeds, Dave. I thought about bringing a whole bag of seeds and just... Phew. You know the story, the, the sower with the seeds? See, I'm the sower, but you're the ground. Your heart, your mind, you are the ground. And so I did my part. I cast the seed. I planted the seed. I threw it out. Now it's up to you to determine what type of soil you are. Come on, think about it. Are you the good soil? That where the seed will go in and be planted and grow into a great harvest? You determine. You choose what type of soil you are. But if I can plant seeds on Sunday, it might just grow on Monday. Come on, it might grow on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, 14 days from now, or next Saturday, which is my birthday. Just trying to plant some seeds, y'all. I'm, I'm joking, I'm joking. <laughs> but we determine the type of soil that we are. God spoke today. Listen, this wasn't a word from Joseph. This is a seed. And I want to know what the seed was that God spoke to you today. 
I want to know what will happen with it. For some of you, you walked in with a seed of bitterness in your heart, unforgiveness in your heart, in your mind. You, you're, you're harboring hate, anger, unforgiveness in your heart. But you know what the Bible says. It's biblical. If you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven. It, it's like this. I, I preached a sermon, I think it was six years ago. Forgiven, forgiving, forgiven. And so when we forgive, we're, we're forgiven, right? And one lady, she was sitting right where you're at, Dave, right at the service. She came up to me, and I said this in the sermon. I said, I'm not going to hell for anybody. And so I choose to forgive. See, when we forgive, we win. When we choose to forgive, we win. When we choose not to forgive, the devil wins. Think about it. And so she came up to me and said, do you really believe that unforgiveness will send you to hell? I said, hell yeah. I said, yes. And she walked out of the door and never came back to church. She couldn't receive it. I was preaching at a local church two years later. She came up to me before service. Do you still believe that unforgiveness will send you to hell? Yes, I, I actually do. You know why? Because the Bible tells me so. And so, you know, she had a bitterness issue, an unforgiveness issue that she couldn't let go. Can I be transparent with you today as your pastor? There was a time back in my Texas church where I had bitterness towards another staff member and I dealt with it for, for two years and the devil convinced me everything they did, everything they said was against me and so I hated everything they did every time I saw them preach or, or, or do anything I couldn't, ah the devil had me just wound up like a pretzel y'all and I hated them in my heart. I took a, like a sabbatical, seven day sabbatical. Another staff member knew what was happening. Right before I left that day, she put a book on my desk and said, I want you to read this on your sabbatical. And it was called The Bait of Satan by John Brevere. It talks about offenses. The devil, the devil uses offenses. And I began to read that on my sabbatical. Two days into it, it was at midnight, God set me completely free. I mean, it was, it was just like a weight that had lifted off of me. I, I, I began to pray for that individual. I said, God, I forgive them. I, I pray they forgive me. I, I went to them right after I got back and said, please forgive me. The devil had me wound up, and, 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 and I was literally set free. But how many know that monkey will jump right back on your back? The, the, the devil will use anything and everything to hit you, to punch you there. And, and, and so things came up, but I chose forgiveness instead of bitterness in that moment. And, and the last two years here, I've been dealing with bitterness with, with someone and with something that had happened. But last Sunday, God set me free from it. Before service, I was praying. I was like, God, I can't do this anymore. I can't, I cannot, I can't, I won't set me free from this because I'd, I'd prayed, I'd tried, but the devil, he, he's so smart, he's so tricky, and he just knows where and how to hit you. But I promise you with all my heart, last Sunday I said it, I was set free and delivered. And so I say that, all of that to say this, if a pastor deals with bitterness, I'm sure there's some people in the church that deal with it. And maybe it was the seed of bitterness that you walked in with. But I promise you, you can walk out with a seed of forgiveness. That he can set you free, deliver you. And, and I'm not saying you have to restore the relationship. You don't have to go back and 
be best friends with so and so but when you choose to forgive you win but when you choose to not forgive the devil wins if everyone could stand to their feet if you're here today and you say pastor I've been harboring hate, anger, bitterness, unforgiveness in my heart towards so and so maybe even God with every head bowed, every eye closed, I want to pray for those people. I want to pray that God would, His presence would be so real in this moment that you would feel without a shadow of a doubt His presence. You would know that His presence is here. The Bible says that there's freedom. Come on, there's freedom in His presence. And when the sun sets you free, you are free indeed. His presence is present in this room today. Freedom is present in this room today. Forgiveness is present in this room today. Father, I pray for each and every person that might have walked in harboring hate in their hearts and in their minds, unforgiveness, bitterness towards a brother or sister, towards an unbeliever, towards a, another church member, towards a pastor, towards a, a family member, towards a stranger, a work, employee, a classmate, got an ex. I pray that, that some would be set free from unforgiveness for their ex today. And that bitterness would be released in Jesus' mighty name. And that they would no longer be barren in that area of their life, but they would begin to be fruitful. Father, I pray for fruit to come through this service today. Because bitterness was dealt with. If you're here today and you've got bitterness in your heart, I don't want you to walk out of here with bitterness in your heart. Confess it to God right here, right now. Give it to God. Lay it at His feet. Ask Him to fill your heart and your mind with forgiveness, compassion, with love, with, with all of the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness. And even that last one, that hard one, self-control. Father, I pray for every person that has bitterness in their heart that they would leave this place free in Jesus name come on confess it to him right now you, you don't have to confess it to me confess it to him give it to him right here right now where you are give it to him don't leave this place in bitterness and unforgiveness with hate in your heart father we give it to you we lay it at your feet Set us free. We thank you. Come on, we thank you. We thank you for the freedom. We thank you for setting us free. We thank you that we're no longer bitter. We thank you that we're no longer living in unforgiveness. In your mighty name. Amen. 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 Somebody shout amen. So just as emotions, just as bitterness is a choice, so is forgiveness. Hmm? We choose to forgive. We choose to let it go. All right, that's all I got. God bless you.